Hello and welcome to Recurrent Patterns, where we look for interesting patterns in technology, business, and culture. I'm your host, Václav Pinčálek. Today on Recurrent Patterns, we will be talking about speed. And who better to talk about speed than the most expert, uh, my very special guest, Dr. Ben Evans. Dr. Evans is an associate professor in aerospace engineering at University at Swansea, uh, Wales, UK. And also he sits on the design team for the Bloodhound Land Speed Record Project. Welcome to the show, Ben. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me on. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you. So um, before we get to the main topic of uh, speed, talking about speed and Bloodhound, uh, if you can share with us what, what is the area of interest? What was the, your research area and what basically led you into working on the Bloodhound project? Yeah, so um, I'll try and keep the story short. But basically, I, um, I came to Swansea in Swansea University back in 2004 to embark on a PhD. And I was interested. I, I had a background in aerospace. That's what I'd studied at, at university. And I'd started getting interested in the field of what we call computational fluid dynamics, um, which, you know, for the last 20 years has been a pretty big topic in the world of aerospace engineering. Um, and essentially, it's the, the field of computer modeling of aerodynamic flows. So how do we use big, powerful computers to do the kind of things that traditionally we might have done in a big wind tunnel, in a real physical wind tunnel? We're now doing that in the virtual world. And that was an area that was kind of interesting me. And I embarked on a PhD in that area. Um, and that PhD was all about looking at are there, are there new, interesting um, mathematical equations that describe aerodynamic flows? that could be readily solved by high performance computers. So I was, um, I was coming to the end of my PhD, really not, not entirely sure what I was gonna do with that next. Um, and my PhD supervisor approached me and just said, look, we've been approached by this chap whose name is Richard Noble. Um, you might've heard of him. He held the land speed record back in the 1980s um, and he wants to do it again. He, he's got his sight set on designing a land speed record car that in principle would be able to reach a speed of 1000 miles per hour. So I, I mean, to be honest with you, the, the first question I asked myself was, well, well, why, why would we want to do that? You know, this, this is going back now to 2007, 2008. So, you know, it, it's already becoming clear that the world is approaching this kind of global financial crisis. And I'm being told that what the world needs is a 1000 mile per hour car. So my kind of obvious first response was, well, I, you know, what, why would you do this? Like, what, what's the purpose of this? Um, and when, and when, really, when it was explained to me that ultimately the objective of this was, to, you know, to do some, to do something difficult, to do something that lots of people would say is impossible, um, using pioneering engineering technology, all, and almost the ultimate purpose is just to, to show the world you know, how good Britain still is at engineering and also to inspire young people to, to, to get into science and engineering. Really, that was the thing that grabbed me. It wasn't so much the spectacle of getting a car to go fast or even seeing the obvious end benefits to society of a fast car. It was more to do with showcasing technology and inspiring young people. So that's, that's how I got involved in Bloodhound. And that was all the way back in 2008. Back in those days, we, you know, we, we perhaps ambitiously thought that we could have the whole project wrapped up in four or five years. And here we are a decade on and we're still working on it. Uh, so the, okay, so thousand miles per hour, that, that's uh, what, one, 1,600 and change uh, kilometers per hour. Yeah. Um, so that, that, that's pretty fast, right? So what, what, what is the speed of, uh, speed of sound? Yeah, so that, that, that is very fast. So the speed of sound typically it varies with temperature, but it's, it's, it's of the order 750, 760 miles an hour or 340-ish meters per second. So, you know, we're talking about significantly faster than the speed of sound. Um, and, that's, and that's why you need an aerodynamicist on the team, because that's where one of the real big challenges about a modern land speed record comes in. Um. Okay, so you, obviously you have to work with some constraints here. What, what uh, because it, it's, it's perhaps easy to strap a rocket on anything and just send it out and eventually it will reach the speed, but there are some constraints in order to be recognized as the world record. 
Sure, yeah. So, I mean, one, one of the beauties of the land speed record compared to lots of other motorsport disciplines is that the constraints are actually relatively minimal. So, you know, the record, you know, the record rules basically state your vehicle must have a minimum of four wheels. It must have a human being on board who is controlling the vehicle. Um, you must steer the car using at least two of those wheels. Um, and it's your average speed measured over a mile in two opposite directions that gives you your, your record. Those, those are basically your constraints, you know, and, and one of the joys, if you look at the history of the land speed record, one of the reasons I think it's such a fascinating engineering discipline is that because the rules are so minimal, the number of ways you can solve this problem, you know, are, are massively increased. Compare, you know, compare that to Formula One, where the yes. rule book, you know, is like this, which basically means all the cars look the same. Whereas, yeah. whereas land speed records, you know, the rules you can fit it on half a page of paper, and therefore every land speed record car looks quite difficult, uh, different. But um, you know, for, for for me as the aerodynamicist, very early on, it became clear that the big challenges are well. First of all, how do you keep the thing on the ground? And second of all, how do you keep the drag acting on the vehicle as low as possible? Because then that. You know, the, the, the lower you can keep the drag, the smaller the engines need to be to get you to a, you know, a given speed. Um, and really, those are the questions that have been plaguing me, I guess, for a decade. <laughs> so how do you keep it on the ground? Because if, you, if you're going a thousand, a thousand miles per hour, uh, you start getting lit. And how, how, do you, how, how do you adjust for it? Yeah, so... When we started looking at this, you know, intuitively, you think, right, the challenge is how do we keep the car on the ground, which is true. But it quickly becomes more complicated than that, because, you know, the kind of aerodynamic loads you can generate on a on a body this size, traveling at in excess of the speed of sound. Yes, you could easily generate too much lift and it turns into an aircraft, which we don't want. But equally, you know, if you just put some great big wings on it and angled them down to generate downforce like a Formula One car, you could easily generate so much downforce that you just drive the car into the ground and you've got the world's fastest plow and not the world's fastest car. So actually the challenge quickly becomes, how do you control those vertical forces on the car? You know, How do you keep them within sensible bounds? That means all four wheels are always in contact with the ground and always you know, have a sensible loading on the ground. Um, and really, that's been one of the big challenges we've had to overcome um, in, in the aerodynamic design of the car. So do, do you dynamically change the shape of, of, of the car, of parts, to, to uh, adjust for the speed? So, so no. Well, well we, ha we have the potential to be able to do that on Bloodhound. So, I mean, what we were always strive to do, like our design philosophy always with Bloodhound was, let's try and make the car as kind of insensitive to the speed it's traveling at as, you, as we possibly can. So we've tried to get the basic shape of the car so that we don't need to adjust anything through a run. It's always generating a small amount of downforce. Now, we did some testing of the, the, you know, the real car last year um, in South Africa, and we managed to take the car up to 628 miles an hour without any moving surfaces on it. So all the loads we were, we were measuring were within these kind of fine tolerances that we were aiming for. Um, but when we go faster, and certainly when we attempt a land speed record, which I really hope will happen in the next year or two, we probably will need to add on some small winglets to the rear of the car just to trim some of those vertical loads to keep them within the, like, the tolerance bands we need. Right. Um, also, what about uh, temperature? Like once you start moving the car that fast, you start providing you, you start getting lots of heat you do so it's this is an interesting one so i mean of course you do and you know people hear these stories about concord because it, you, you know it was traveling so fast it generated friction on the surface which heated it up the the beauty of the land speed record is because we literally you know we accelerate up to peak speed in about 40 45 seconds we're at peak speed for a matter of seconds and then quickly decelerate down again there isn't enough time for that kind of thermal loading to build up the the real place that there is a heating effect it's got nothing to do with the aerodynamics it's just the fact that you've got a great big jet and rocket throwing hot gases out the back of the car and that's where we need to be careful about the heat right and um 
also when I was uh, looking at the videos of, of, of the Bloodhound, uh, which by the way, I will post all the videos with this, uh, with this interview. So uh, everybody who's interested can follow these up. Uh, how do you make wheels which can sustain this? Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. And in fact, throughout the process of designing the car, the one point or the, the couple of, one of the two points probably where we thought to ourselves, maybe maybe this actually isn't possible. You know, that you, right from the start of the project, in the back of our mind, there was always this kind of question of, are we going to get to a point in the design process where we go, it can't be done. You just cannot do it. And the, and the wheels was one of them because, you know, these things at, at top speed, the, the wheels will be rotating somewhere approaching 10,000 RPM. They're a meter in diameter. And there, there simply are no wheels with, with kind of rubber tires that would, you know, not blow themselves apart at these kind of rotational speeds. So they're solid metal wheels. And for a long time, we were concerned that we just couldn't find, um, a, well, first of all, we thought maybe titanium was gonna be, have to be the, 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 the metal of choice. And we just couldn't find a supplier of that much titanium willing to gift us, you know, four big blocks of titanium. That, that reminds me of the uh, SR-71 uh, project, right, where they were stealing the titanium from Russians yeah. to, to build the plane. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I Bloodhound's been a bit like that. It's been beg, steal and borrow because there's no money in this, right? I mean, this, that, that's, the, that's the other big challenge, which you've got to admit, it is nobody's going to get rich off a land speed record project. So... As, as big as the engineering challenge is, funding this has been a massive challenge as well. Um, but yeah, so the, so the wheels are generating incredible loads at the rim because of the rate at which they're spinning. Um, and it took us a long time to find the kind of optimal wheel design that minimized the stresses at the, 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 the wheel rims to the point where we could find an aluminum alloy solution to the wheel design. But, um, you know, and, and it could well be that wheel wheel loading becomes the ultimate limit on how fast you can possibly take a car with wheels. Right. Um, while I was watching the video, the, the, uh, the very uh, challenging uh, the challenging problem also is the, the shape, the profile of the wheel as it's touching the ground, because you, you guys start with the V shape and yeah. basically you start uh, ripping apart the, the ground beneath that. Yeah. So, so the wheel ground interaction is a real, it's a, it's a real difficult challenge, partly because until you run the car on the particular surface that you're going to be running on at these kind of speeds, you just don't know how it's going to interact with the surface. There's, you know, there are no textbooks that you can go and pick up and go, if you make a wheel profile this shape and run it on this surface at 700 miles an hour, this is how it will interact. And so that's been one of the areas while we've been testing the car, you know, last year that we were really interested to, to understand is to what extent will those wheels penetrate into the surface? To what extent will they generate traction to allow the car to actually be steered and be controllable? Um, I mean, fortunately, you know, all the data we got back from the car during the high speed test program last year looked, you know, gave us a lot of confidence that the wheel design we've got seems about right we're getting about the right amount of penetration with the surface because if you get too much that becomes drag and you just can't accelerate the vehicle if you don't get enough the car is just skimming across the top of the surface and it's not controllable so you know you've got to get the balance right between those two and it look and it looks like we're we're about there mm -hmm. and well the wheels are one thing but how, how do you connect them what about the bearings like what what kind of how do you attach to axles yeah. Yeah, it's a good, that's a good question that I don't know the answer to. So I'll just put my hands up and go, uh, yeah. So I haven't been involved in, like, the, the work that I've been doing is really focused on the external shape of the car. As soon as you're inside the skin, I lose interest because I just <laughs> want to keep the thing on the ground and minimize the drag. But yeah, yeah I mean, bearing design, I know, has been a big issue, um, but it's not, it's not part of the project that I've been involved in. Right. And so you, you were talking also about the engine. So what, what kind of uh, engines are we talking about here? Yeah. So I know we... Right. Yeah. So we've got two um, engine systems to deliver the thrust to push us forwards. Um, the, the the engine system that we've already installed in the car is uh, an EJ two hundred jet engine, which is the jet engine that's used in the Eurofighter Typhoon. Um, so so, so that, and that was the only propulsion system we had in the car when we tested it last year. Um, so that was enough to get us up to six hundred and twenty eight miles an hour. So you know that's pretty fast. So so already even just as part of our testing. Bloodhound has become the third fastest car in the world. 
Um, and that was just part of our kind of slowly, slow, you know, slow increase in speed through testing. Um, That's the driving through the parking lot. It, well, yeah, for us. <laughs> um, so, so we've got, um, yeah, a, a turbofan jet engine, but when we take the car back to South Africa to, to attempt a record, we are going to have to supplement that with um, a monopropellant rocket system, the kind, of, the kind of rocket system you use, you know, for, for rockets to go into space. We're going to supplement that um, and include that on the car, which is part of the work that's ongoing now is working with the, the rocket supplier who's based in Norway um, and making sure that we've got the right rocket system to supplement the jet engine system. I think it's, it's uh, difficult to start the rocket engine, but also you need to shut it down yeah. very quickly, right? Because so, so, otherwise yeah. you end up uh, really far. Yeah, so, so the, um, the reason we went with this hybrid system is, I mean, uh, the, the beauty of a rocket system is it's not air breathing, so you don't need to worry about an air intake to get air into the system. And you get, com you know, compared to a jet engine, you get more kind of thrust per unit mass out of it. So given the mass of the rocket, you get more thrust per kilogram. The problem with a rocket system is they're essentially like a firework, right? You kind of turn, you turn it on. Yes. It gives you, a, it gives you thrust and then you turn it off. It's, it's, it, you can't control that thrust to the extent you can with a jet engine. You know, with a jet engine, you say, give me 50,000 newtons of thrust, set the throttle to there, and that's what it gives you. And it's controllable. You know, if, you, if it's giving you a little bit too much, you pull it back. If you want more, you push it, you push the throttle forward. A, a, a rocket system is, you know, you just, it's on or it's off, basically. Um, so the combination of the two, the rocket system, which is giving you a lot of thrust for a relatively low mass system, combined with the jet, which allows you to then control the net thrust, we felt it was like an, op an optimal combination um, for the car. Um, amazing. You know, there is, uh, this is, I think, that the beautiful part of, of this whole project is the uh, indigenity of people, you know, they can think of something and they can build it, right? When, when, when humans put mind into th uh, something, especially engineers, of course. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. They, they, they well, come up with things which, uh, that's how you show that what you can do. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, you know, often when, when I'm asked, you know, like, why, why are you still plugging away at Bloodhound? You know, I've been doing this now. To 2008, I joined the project. So it's over a decade I've been working on this. And, you know, often people ask me, why are you still working on it? And often my answer is because it's difficult. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a good thing for engineers or for anyone, but certainly for engineers to do things simply because they're difficult. Because the reality is whenever you do something that's difficult, you learn. And so, you know, over those 10 years, we've been developing technologies with the, you know, with the goal of how do you make a car go really fast? But actually already we're seeing, oh, hang on a minute now, that could be used for this more conventional application. So, you know, in, in my world of, of computational fluid dynamics or CFD, you know, we developed systems for Bloodhound to improve the way in which you integrate CFD, so aero modeling, into the, the design cycle. Well, of course, once you've developed that for you know, that specific application, we're now looking at, well, how do you apply that to civil airliners? How do you apply that to wing design in general on aircraft to make them more efficient? So, so for me, what's exciting is that already, even before we've broken a record, we're seeing that there are spin out technologies from this that have applications in more conventional engineering areas which, you know, and that's just because we decided making a car go at a, th a thousand miles an hour is really difficult. So let's give it a go. Uh, what, what was something which, uh, as you were working on, on, the, on this problem, what was something that um, it, it, intuitively you thought, well, it must be something here, but actually yeah. it, it was on the other side, something which you would never kind of yeah. imagine. Yeah, so, I mean, so aerodynamically, I, I went into this, again, not knowing anything really about land speed record car aerodynamics. I just kind of approached it as someone who'd studied aerodynamics at university and just looked at cars going fast and thought, well, what, what, sh how should they behave? And in my mind, the big challenge in terms of keeping the car on the ground in my head was always just going to be the nose. In my mind, I thought to myself, I guess having seen footage of kind of particularly water speed record crashes where boats flip very easily. Oh, yes. In my head... 
the, the real challenge was going to be keeping the nose of the car on the ground. You know, how do you stop it from flipping? But actually, you know, after running lots of computer models of the behavior of the car, we realized as long as you get the shape and the nose height about right, it, it's the nose of the car was fairly stable, was you know, predicted to be fairly stable. The real challenge was at the back of the car where you've got this very complicated geometry because it's a car, it's got wheels, you're right. If you, if you could take the wheels off it, my life would get a lot easier, right? But, it, but at the, it's gotta be, it's gotta have wheels because it's called a car. And the, the rear wheels are widely spaced to give it kind of roll stability, I guess. And all of that complex geometry was generating at speeds approaching the speed of sound, these shock waves. And those shock waves in the initial designs we had of the car were basically picking the whole back of the car up. If we had gone ahead with some of the early designs we had for Bloodhound, at the kind of speeds we achieved last year, the whole back of the car would have lifted up off the ground and it would have become almost like a wheelbarrow, you know? Um, and, I, and I didn't see that coming, that the, the challenge with keeping the car kind of vertically loaded within limits would all be about the back end of the car and that complex geometry at the back, rather than just how do you keep the nose on the ground? Um, so yeah, so lots of little things like that. And then, and then when we started thinking about, well, hang on a minute now, we're, we're not just gonna be traveling through pure air, as is, you know, the, the world of most aerodynamicists is aircraft up in the sky. And the luxury up there is the only thing that's around you is air. And we pretty much know how air behaves. This thing is on the ground. And if you see footage of, you know, historic land speed record cars, quickly you realize it's not just air that they're flowing through. They kick up dust and sand and particles into the flow around the car. So that particularly the back of the car is flowing through this, this soup of particles and dust. And when we started doing some really simple back of the envelope calculations related to like how much additional drag is there because of the fact there are particles being entrained off the surface into the flow, you know, we, we realized it could be, you know, as much as a third of the vehicle drag is not to do with the air, it's to do with all the particles that are being pulled into the flow. So, you know, lots of little things like that, that, you know, at the start of the project, you know, we hadn't necessarily seen coming, but have had to factor into our performance models of the car. And, and, and without basically without modeling, without the, the computer systems which you guys using or the, 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 the software which you're using for modeling, yeah. you, you would not ever be able to, uh, to test this. Well, it's a good question. I, my answer is you certainly couldn't do it safely, you know, there, and you couldn't do it in a cost effective way. So, so the beauty of computer modeling, and I, and I guess in all fields now, this is why we do computer modeling, is it's a relatively cheap way of testing your ideas and getting it to the point where you have enough confidence that you're willing to spend the money to go and build the prototype or the real thing. So, you know, we could, could you, if you had an infinite budget and an infinite amount of time, figure out without a computer model what the right shape of the car is? Well, probably. But, you know, in the real world where we don't have infinite budgets and infinite time, you probably couldn't do it without computer modeling. No, but you certainly couldn't do it safely. You know, we, so what the approach that we have, have taken now in terms of testing the car is, um, you know, doing the test program last year, we slowly ramped up the speed of the car. And on every run, we would take data from the car, you know, measured from things like pressure sensors over the surface and load monitors on the four wheels. And we would compare that data to the computer model data that we use to design the car. And until we had confidence that we understood how those two sets of data related to each other, we wouldn't take the car any faster. So, so, so the testing of the car is as much validation of the computer model as it is just, is the car safe, you know? Right, that, that's basically your QA, right? Your yeah, quiet, yeah, it, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, uh, the, amazing. Um, out of curiosity, what, what kind of computing power are we talking here? Like, you know, yeah, so we so to, to run the kind of simulations we've run for Bloodhound, we need large supercomputers. So we're running on PC clusters of you know maybe two three hundred processors or, or two three hundred cores, um, and it might take you know to run a single simulation. So this is we want to know what's the lift, the drag, the pressure distribution over the car at this particular speed under these particular conditions might take about twenty four hours of runtime say on two, 200, 300 cores of an HPC system. So, you know, in the, 
it's expensive, you know, compared to regular, you know, personal computing. But in the world of high performance computing and CFD, it's not, you know, that's not crazy money. And I, I would say within 24 hours, it reminds me of my uh, uh, the, the youth days when I was at university, when we were running uh, analysis on uh, on PC with the math yeah. coprocessor, which of course yeah. uh, very few people now know what that was. Um, yeah, it, it, it would be running for 24 hours. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. of course, at, at that time, it meant that if you made a mistake in, in the software, you know, in the, in the programming, you suddenly had to uh, redo everything. So you had to wait another day. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, know, that, yeah, that that still happens, I'd like to let you know. So, uh, you know, there, there, there were many occasions where I would run a set of simulations. Or I'd set them off on a Friday afternoon going, these will all have run by Monday morning. Yes. Come in on Monday morning, look at the results, and you realize I set them up all wrong. Yes. <laughs> we're, we're good. That that still happens. Well, but at least you 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 can getting these uh, these answers much faster compared to you know what it would take to build something. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I I think that it, actually uh, I I would say that uh, if within a day you can run one simulation, that that's that's amazing. Like we are in yeah. the in, we live in times where within a day, and. Basically, it's 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 only you put more computers, more cores to, to do it, and you can do yeah. it in half a day or in one yeah, hour. Absolutely. And you, you yeah. get the, the the answer, right? And yeah, and the, and these algorithms that we use now to do this, they you know they're pretty scalable. So you're so you're right. I mean, if if in reality, if you really did need to turn it around quicker than that, you just ramp up the number of cores you're using, and you know they'll scale up to thousands of cores if you have access to that kind of compute power. Um, yeah, so it's, you know, and, and compare if you compare that to the traditional methods of using wind tunnels, you know, if you wanted to do the kind of thing I would do in 24 hours in CFD, but in a wind tunnel, you know, by the time you've figured out what wind tunnel you're going to hire, made a model for the wind tunnel, got into the tunnel, set up, your, you know, you're, you're talking weeks rather than a day to do it with conventional wind tunnel methods. So do, do you think that uh, your uh, the, the system which you designed for the, for the CFD modeling, uh, do you think it will replace the wind tunnels? Uh, it already has, is the reality. You know, in the in the aerospace world, I mean, I should qualify that. I mean, there, there will always be a role for for real physical wind tunnel testing, but increasingly that role is QA of the CFD model, right? So, you know, for example, you know, going all the way back to the Airbus A380. That, that entire project was done, the whole design, aerodynamic design of the A380 was done using CFD. They didn't use physical wind tunnels to test the A380 design until the design process was finished and they just wanted to check the performance in a wind tunnel before the flight testing. Um, and, and that's the world we live in now in aerospace is it's so much slower and more expensive to run physical wind tunnel testing that CFD is usually the default tool, certainly early in the design process. Now, th there will be, you know, I, I can I can already hear if there are experimental aerodynamicists out there listening to this, they'll be screaming at me now. You know, th there are still situations where you can argue the better tool is a wind tunnel. There is, you know, if you've got, particularly in some more complex geometry situations where you've got a lot of unsteadiness in the flow, th there are situations where you might choose to use a wind tunnel over CFD, but the, the vast majority of aerodynamic design work in aerospace and increasingly, you know, in motorsport um, is done through CFD now. Well, and uh, for what, what you cannot do right now, you can always write another library, another module to add to it and <laughs> done, right? How difficult yeah, yeah, yeah. it be, right? Yeah, yeah. and I, so, so for me, I think the exciting thing about, um, you know, where, where computer modeling of aerodynamics CFD is now is, is we're thinking more now about, well, how do we better make use of this tool and how do we just improve the tool itself? So, you know, for 20 years, people have been doing research into like, how do you improve the efficiency of CFD codes and make them more accurate and so on. And some of the work that I'm doing now is more about, okay, we know the tool works. We know it's an accurate way of doing aero analysis. The question now is how do we make better use of it in the context of the design cycle? How do we make it a more automatic process? And also, and I think this is where things get really interesting, is how do we use CFD coupled with computational optimization and kind of human designers? How do we couple those three things together in the most effective way to be using each of those resources efficiently? Um, so that's where a lot of my research is going at the moment. Amazing.
that it, it, it's 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 so fascinating, and f for me, uh, you know, being part of or uh, using computers since uh, there were no computers, uh, you know, for <laughs> last uh, what thirty years, um, it, it's it's amazing how all these things are coming back and forth, back and forth, and you always the guarantee is that it, it always gets better, faster, and easier. And uh, we can suddenly achieve things which we could not even dream of. Yeah. Uh, well, this is absolutely amazing. Thank you very much for the conversation. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that everybody who's going to listen to this uh, will, will be amazed. And all the links will be, of course, uh, a part of the interview. So everybody will be able to uh, check what the Bloodhound Project uh, is doing. Um, Thank you. Uh, I really appreciate uh, uh, your time, Ben. Uh, and uh, for everybody else, thanks for watching. Uh, don't forget to subscribe. And until then, enjoy.